Bismillah. How about you, Dr. Salami? Uh, can do you want me to share the, the screen? Or you can do that from your side. I can do it for you, whichever one that is okay for you. Yeah, Jazakumullah Khairan, Jazakumullah Khairan for having me. Awaz Bilal Min Ash-Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maybe, maybe if you can share from your side. Okay, yes. sure. let me do yeah. that. Hmm. Sometimes this sharing. Um, uh, just give me a few minutes. Let me slide now. So you are sharing with um, was W. Uh, this uh, other... yes, okay. Let me share from directly from my desktop, right? Mm -hmm. I share from, from Google Drive. Let me try and share again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it okay like this? It's just coming up. We haven't seen it yet. Okay. Okay. I think it's up now. Similar. Doctor Sam, can you see it? Okay. Okay. Is it fine? I mean, it looks good now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. We give praise to all my jalawas. Um, make it possible for us to meet here once again. Um, I, I really commend the effort of the ISIP. Uh, West Africa and I mean and the and the global audience and um, the organizers also I really cherish I really um, appreciate all your efforts in making this uh, talk uh, come into reality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have this topic to share. Uh, of call it. Actually, I have this topic to share based on uh, certain developments in the field of psychology. And um, the, the, the title is coined to be um, Islamic Dimension to Meaning and Spirituality. Mm -hmm. So invariably, we'll be looking like talking about how Islam addresses these areas of psychology from positive dimension, from clinical, I mean, all joined together, even in, in collaboration with existential psychology. So we are, we are going to like um, connect these areas of psychology together and how does he uh, how does how does these areas make some kind of um, understanding and insight to us as Muslims? Uh, I, I came up with these slides in in more of an academic framework, and um, in fact, I don't have any Quranic verses inside to 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 be quoted. So, but we'll be looking in. I mean, we'll be looking at every slide from what Islam is saying, either from the Quran, the verses are there for those of us who can maybe have a check out. Yeah, this is also there, check out. And um, yeah, I'll also leave it open to some kind of questions and answers and see how well we, 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 we make it like a collaborative kind of discussion because every, aspect of human life is connected to meaning 
And as far as we Muslims are concerned, we have that religious and that spiritual connection to it. And um, the overview will look like this, like what we have on the screen, religiosity and psychology, religiosity and well-being. Uh, we're going to look like the Islamic dimension to meaning in life. I mean, in some texts, you see it as meaning in life. In some other texts, you may see it as existential meaning. Um, and in, in most texts, you see it as just meaning, right? Uh, then we'll also be looking at how Islam is actually talking about spirituality, because we, we do have various definitions of what spirituality means. Um, then maybe we'll go to the next slide. All right, we, we can introduce like this. Generally, we as human beings, we, we always have that urge, we always have that innate ability. We always have that flair to preserve and protect sacred objects. Everything that has to do with God, everything that has to do with our religion, I mean, we, 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 we always take them serious, right? Everything that has to do with um, our spiritual life, sometimes our religious activities, it, it tends to be something serious to us. So humans are like that. Not only we Muslims, I mean, even other religious and faith believers. and. Um, we also have that likelihood to invest more of ourselves in, in pursuit of things that are sacred. Uh, you can imagine somebody telling you, actually, it's very difficult to, to make money. I mean, businesses are not really looking good. But when it comes to Hajj, for instance, which is like in a couple of days' time, people will get that money. I mean, either by as a result of savings for, for the last couple of months, for some days, I mean, years, some, for some, they, they, they can really invest no matter how much it costs. Why? Because they, they have that belief. They have that idea. They have that conviction that they are going to somewhere sacred, somewhere where their prayers are going to be answered. I mean, with that level of conviction, all right, because this place is a holy site. Um, it's a place where every Muslim will want to find himself or herself. And based on our belief also, it is recommended that at least we are there once in our lifetime. So, I mean, it's a dream for every Muslim to be there, irrespective of how much it costs. Yeah, people are very much ready to do this. Apart from that, there are other things, there are other aspects of our religious life where we, we are very much convinced that while we engage in them, we have certain benefits to derive. Like in the last Ramadan, we have the itikaf. Uh, no matter how challenging it is to, to leave, our, to leave our, uh, our comfort zone in our houses, and go to the monks to stay there for, the, for, for, for a couple of days because it is in the last 10 days of Ramadan. People are ready to invest into that. I mean, they are ready to, you know, go into that spiritual mood, that spiritual activity in order to derive certain benefits that is connected to, to Allah, is connected to our next life is connected to even our worldly life, all right? Because we are going there to pray and we have that conviction that whatever we tell Allah in these situations, is going to listen to us and is going to grant our requests. That's, that's what we are trying to look at here. I mean, we, we are really connected, not only Muslims, we have other religions also. Um, I mean, other faithfuls who are actually holding on to this. And, as a result of all this, we, we tend to derive more meaning. Very soon we are going to look at what meaning means. We derive strength. 
And we have this satisfaction from the sacred, right? And um, how this connects to our lives, we, we have that conviction, yeah. And as a result of our belief mixed with our religious commitment, mixed with our ability to engage in every aspect of what we like doing in terms of ibadat, in terms of um, every aspect of our religious life. We, we have the conviction that yes, we, we are going to live a better life. We are going to live a, a, a very fruitful life in the year after. We are going to live, I mean, there's that connection, there's that conviction. We see our life as something more meaningful when we connect it to the religious activities we do and our belief system all mixed up, right? Um, let me go to the next slide. Now, one thing that actually drives all this has to do with belief. Yeah, it's a cognitive thing. It's also connected to certain number of activities that we do, all right? The, 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 the strong part of it is the articles of faith, right? We believe in Allah, we believe in Allah's existence. We, we have that conviction that yes, Allah is in control of our life. He's the one that created us and he's the one that makes things happen to us. And he's the only one that can help us to solve our problems. I mean, looking at the belief in the angels, looking at everything that has to do with the articles of faith in Islam, um, it all connects to the, to the fact that whatever we do as Muslims religiously is basically as a result of how strong is our faith, how strong is the conviction we have that yes, if I pray, Allah is going to answer my prayers. If anything happens to me, I know the problem or the suffering is going to take some while and there is going to be a relief afterwards. I mean, all this connects to some areas of our articles of faith we, we have as Muslims. And another aspect is that we, we have that conviction that yes, Allah is very much with us. We pray to him five times daily. In fact, I was listening to one video, I was watching one video, uh, one new convert from somewhere in Europe. And he was saying he's praying six times a day. And when he was describing the sixth one, he was talking about Tajud, right? And um, it shows that even while we are sleeping, around 3 a.m., 4 a.m., we have the condition that even when we wake up at that time, we are praying to Allah, and Allah is even much more closer to us compared to the five daily ones, all right? So that sense of Allah's consciousness uh, doesn't only connect to our spiritual life, it also connects with our daily activities, our daily functioning as, as humans. Either we are students or we are workers or we are businessmen. I mean, we, we, we all connect whatever we do to Allah. We all believe that his presence has something to do with our, our decision making. It has something to do with our interrelationship with others, our belief in the angels also gives us the conviction that yes, if I've done my askar in the morning, I've done my askar in the evening, the angels are there to protect me from dangers. There is that conviction. Uh, we, we also have the conviction that yes, when I say certain prayers, when I do certain things, I have certain spiritual benefit to get, all right? And we're also convinced that based on our last consciousness in our mind, in our, in our cognition, we are very much convinced that um, even if I spend money, I engage in any kind of pro-social behavior, I do something in form of sadaka, I'm going to get the reward even in this life, okay? So all this also gives us the, the idea that having that consciousness of Allah, give us a clear direction of what we do as Muslims, 
and it's very much connecting to the fact that that belief factor is paramount to everything that we do, all right? Without the belief, it's, it's not going to be that easy, okay? It's not going to be that easy to, to navigate most of these things that we do in our life. And we'll go to see how these belief structures, I mean, these articles of faith and this uh, faith-oriented cognitions that we have connects to how well we are able to derive meaning in our life and how our life becomes meaningful to us. I mean, everything is connected. And also our worldview. Our worldview is um, very much in line with the fact that what we are doing in this life is, is just temporal, okay? No matter the kind of enjoyment we have in this life is temporal. No matter the amount of suffering we are passing through is temporal in this life. There is another life coming up, all right? And that life cannot be attained until when we pass through the, the, the reality of death, okay? And um, getting through that phase also, we are going to get to that. Getting through that phase also is not that easy but it can only be much more easy when our belief structure is very much in place. <clears throat> We're having that consciousness of the fact that Allah is very much with us. I mean, irrespective of whichever level of uh, livelihood we are passing through, this, this world view of the fact that whatever we, we, we do, whatever we experience, and whatever purpose we have in terms of living in this life is connected to another life, right? Yeah, we, we have that worldview that everything here is just ephemeral, everything here is just a period of time. And, and the way Allah used to describe them in the verses of the Quran, I mean, until a particular time appointed, there's a particular time where the world is going to end. That's for sure, all right? And for the fact that it's going to end, it's not known to us where and where. Uh, I think some verses are the, in the last part of Surah to the Luqman. They are, they are, they are, Allah is talking about this there, where and where we are going to die, it's not known to us. As a result of that, we, we see this world as a place where we just come to do everything at the best of our disposal in pleasing Allah, in making life a better place for us, for our families, for our loved ones, all right, and to the entire humanity. So that also connects to like engaging in, in things that makes other people's lives better apart from ours. So everything is connected. Everything is connected. Maybe next slide. Um, So general religion has been viewed as a conservational force in coping with any form of distress. This is as a result of some number of studies conducted across the globe, most especially in the, in the United States, in Europe. I mean, among non-Muslims even, religion has been seen to be a very strong force in terms of coping with psychological distress and suffering and you can imagine you can imagine where survivors of earthquake for instance in the last two months that happened in Turkey in Istanbul survivors are very much you know at the brink of or let me say at the at the at the highest level of suffering when they've seen their loved ones die all their Houses gone, businesses gone. I mean, the entire life is gone. Some to some, the entire family members is gone. Maybe only them, only him or I is the is the is the, is the, is the surviving one. I mean, and what comes out from his mouth or from my mouth is that this is what Allah has decreed and it has come to pass. Something like that. I mean, that alone, that alone shows that. 
even when the entire world looking as if it's ending in your very sight, you are still connecting your particular situation to Allah, and that helps that kind of person to cope more and move on. I mean, it's only religion that can give this to you. I don't know which psychological therapy that can help to reduce such kind of distress, okay? Research studies have shown that among Muslims and non-Muslims alike, all right? And for us as Muslims, we, we see it as one of the best form of, you know, coping with stress. I was listening to an American expert while undergoing a particular training on trauma, and we we're looking at how survivors cope. And this Quranic verse was quoted, and I was like, I was shocked, all right? Based on the fact that the, 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 the researcher, I mean, this American researcher was gathering data from some number of Muslims in a war zone, I think somewhere in, in Sudan, years back. So, and based on what the participants are telling her at that time, indicates a means of coping by this group of people. And it helps them to, to really heal quickly. It helps them to cope with their distress at the time. And it, it makes a lot of sense to her. And she was quoting this verse based on the, 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 the information, based on the, the, the comments gotten from the, the survivors of, of war at the time. Somewhere in Darfur, you know, there is this crisis in Darfur last time. So, yes, generally it is seen this way. Being able to hold on to or sustain the sense of meaning, control, comfort, intimacy, or spiritual connection in the midst of life crisis. Our, our religious belief, our religious understanding, the insights we get from various Quranic verses from the Hadith gives us that leverage to to be able to withstand certain level of suffering that we, we can never pass through, all right? I'll be giving some instances as time goes on. Next slide, next slide. Okay. From findings from various research, uh, either in area of psychology of religion or in the area of existential psychology or positive psychology, I mean, these are areas that uh, involves religious or spiritual variables in studies. Uh, we have some number of journals already in these areas, either from Islamic or other religious dimensions. Religion has been proved to, to provide hope optimism and meaning. Uh, it has been proved also to relieve people from stressors. It plays our lives in a greater perspective. Now, when we say greater perspective, what we are saying here is it, it puts up, it makes us have this higher level of understanding of what this life really means to us. I mean, I've, I've had some number of experts. Um, there is this particular prof. I, 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 I quoted his, um, I quoted his uh, level of death anxiety, high stages of level of death anxiety in the, in the upcoming slides. I mean, based on our understanding as Muslims, this life, when connected to the next life, make a lot of sense to us. And due to our religious background, due to our religious belief, due to our, um, our conceptual understanding of what, you know, our, our belief means to us, our religious activities means to us, our acts of ibadah means to us, it, it gives us a much more clearer picture of what we can experience in this life and a much more bigger picture of what you can experience in the next life, all right? That alone cannot be obtained anywhere, except in our scripts, in our understanding. It, it, it really places us in a greater perspective. Uh, religion comes in positive forms, working with God to get through challenging times, okay? 
and it, sometimes it comes with negative forms. We have Muslims, we have non-Muslims who ask various questions when challenges comes. Why is this happening to me? I mean, we have this negative dimension to religion. Some even use religious belief to, to like, uh, how will I put it, to buttress the idea of suicidal ideation they have. There is this patient where after the wife passed away, a Christian, after the wife passed away, and seriously in distress, seriously in state of bereavement, I mean, um, and after getting to see a therapist, he was telling the therapist that um, I'm getting very much disconnected with my life currently, and I'm contemplating going to meet my wife in heaven. All right? This, an individual who has a very strong belief in the next life, he knows there is heaven somewhere, but at the same time, due to the fact that he has lost touch, he has lost connection, he doesn't see the reason why he should live anymore because the wife has passed away. And he's now using that religious understanding to buttress the reason why he wants to commit suicide. That's a negative aspect of you know, religious understanding. All right. We also have Muslims saying things like that, or maybe maybe not at the level of you know societal thought, but at the level of you know questioning God and asking some kind of why questions when things difficult happens. All right. Yeah, due to their feelings and due to the way they comprehend, due to their interpretation of that event that has happened, due to some number of things. Yeah, these kind of questions can come up. So we see them as negative forms, All right? Uh, next slide, next slide. Um, now let's look at meaning. Let's look at meaning in terms of what it actually means and was, 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 or what, what are the, uh, the historical connection to the, to the concept called meaning. Meaning has been in psychology for some years back, uh, maybe like, I cannot really say per se, but after the Second World War in 1945 down to 1950, after the war ended, the Second War ended, Victor Franklin came up with this idea of meaning, existential meaning, and he wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning. I believe some of us have come across this book. Uh, he explained what happened to him, his family members, and other uh, Jews at the time. He is a Jew. And he came up with this idea that at the highest level of suffering, at the highest level of suffering, when, when it comes to destruction, when it comes to death of family members, when it comes to a situation where in the concentration camps, if you are found being showing some kind of laziness when you are working, the next thing is for you to be shot dead because you showing that laziness and being slow in working is going to discourage others. So the, the, the army men and the soldiers are going to shoot you in the presence of others to serve as deterrence that nobody should be lazy. So at that highest level of death and destruction, uh, Victor Franklin did survive the, the, the war, uh, which his family member didn't, all right? Some, some number of his family members did not survive. And after the entire thing, after the war, he, he, he came up with that concept, all right? He came up with this concept of meaning and he wrote a lot, he wrote a lot about this, that meaning do come as a result of suffering. Meaning is derived from human suffering. It is when we get to that highest level of suffering, we realize that this life has a lot for us, something like that. I don't know if we can comprehend it in this way. Let's, let's keep looking at it. That ability to comprehend, make sense of, or see significance in one's life 
as if one serves to have a purpose in life. So when, when we see this definition like this, we see meaning in this context, we can see that some number of factors are conjoined together, all right? Our level of comprehension about what life means, how well we're able to make sense of what we are experiencing in life, how well do we see significance in what we are experiencing in this life? I mean, now, how do we even perceive ourselves to be having purpose in what we want to achieve in life? These questions also can be gathered together to give us an idea of what meaning actually means, all right? Um, yeah, Victor, frankly, I've connected it to suffering. At the same time, it may not even get to the level of suffering before we attain it. As Muslims, yes. All right. And um, when we see it from this dimension, we could see that our life as Muslim already has some, some connected, I mean, some connection to meaning in, in, in the package of what we have as our beliefs, what we have as our articles of faith. I mean, we already have it packed. How well we're able to identify them, how well we're able to identify what makes our life meaningful to us as Muslims, now depends on individuals, all right? Uh, Spiritual-wise, when every event, life event makes sense to us, yes, whatever happens, whatever happens, we are supposed to have certain derivations from, from it in terms of how meaningful is this to my life? What is this? events telling me, how well do I interpret what has happened, all right? Yes, whatever the suffering is, whatever the difficulty is, how do we interpret it? How do we comprehend its, you know, its meaning? And under what circumstances do I see it as something beneficial to me and not harmful to me, all right? We, we do have some number of uh, positive coaches giving us all these ideas, uh, even in social media. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much like um, on a daily basis, we read them. But sometimes we find it still difficult to, to comprehend. Let me give a, an example here. About three or four weeks ago, uh, I'm trying to paint a picture of how suffering looks like. I was to board a flight from Kuala Lumpur to Lagos because my dad is sick and I wanted to go and see him. I mean, seriously sick. And um, it has been disturbing that I need to just leave Kuala Lumpur. I need to go and see him in Lagos. Uh, I bought a ticket like less than 24 hours before my flight. At that point in time, I didn't even care how much it costs, okay? And um, now, due to Russia, due to the nature of what I have to do before I travel and trying to address one or two things. I have something to submit to my HOD. I mean, while I was booking that flight, I didn't take a very strong cognizance of the timing of that flight. The flight is even less than 15 hours after the time I was booking it. The time for the flight was 09 a.m., okay? And what was in my head at that time was 9.55, I mean, something like 9 p.m. in the night. So I prepared everything. I got there around 7 p.m., trying to get a check-in and, you know, and in the Qatar Airways, there was nothing there in their, in their counter. And I went to the information desk and I was told my flight is 9.09.55 a.m. And I was like, wow. Of course, as an African man, I just put my hand on the head. I mean, and I was like, okay, thank you for the information. And I pick a call, I pick a call with my wife, and I just told her this is what had happened. Alhamdulillah, it was my grip time. I just walked straight to the to the mox area in the in the airport at the time. I performed my wudu and performed my Maghrib and Ishai for for. And, and it was like, okay, now let me start dealing with this. 
Then I was a bit calm because when this lady reminded me of my flight time, I was not calm at all. I mean, that is very, very tough. I've never experienced that in my whole life. And um, after the do after my salad, I was a bit calm. I just picked my phone. I have Qatar Airways app on my phone. I started checking and checking, and I navigated through getting an agent, and the agent said, okay, I need to pay this amount. There's another flight in the next four hours. Okay, that's fine with me. Like I said, the money is not even the issue. At this time, I pay more. And, you know, it's, it's more like no matter the level of suffering, no matter the level of difficulty, we, we just need to have that comprehension and get to understand that what has happened has already been distinct, one. What has happened has been designed to happen in that way. The reason why it has happened, you may not have any idea, but I mean, it makes sense in, this, in, the, in, the, in the entire framework that, okay, what has happened to me now, yes, I just have to accept it. Acceptance needs to come in. We, we do have these stages of uh, denial and all those things before you get to acceptance might be difficult. So for we Muslims, it shouldn't. All right? For we Muslims, yes, we might be in a state of denial. It shouldn't be that difficult for us to connect and accept the fact that what has happened has actually been destined to happen. What has happened will surely come to pass. The suffering may be just very serious now, but later it's going to subside. And at the end of the day, we may have a relief, all right? So all this belief in, in the destiny, belief in, in our, in our uh, fitra and everything all comes together to help us out when challenges come, when difficult times come. So it now depends on that individual Muslim, if he or she has everything in this package, like we've been talking about, I mean, the faith package, the belief structure package, everything joined together can help to help, I mean, can help to deliver meaning to, to, to you when the time comes. So at the end of the day, I come to realize everything becomes much more meaningful to me, even though my flights I lost initially is like six hours behind. I was supposed to be in Lagos by 8 a.m. I got to Lagos around 3 p.m., right? Still the same day. And everything looks fine, all right? So the thing is, at any point where we are having challenges, we only just need to calm down, look at the scenario very much clearly because cognitively things will keep flying here and there, yes. Thoughts, emotions, we keep flying here and there, and um, it, it all boils down to how well we are able to look at the entire scenario, have a bigger picture of what has happened, connect it to our to our faith, connect it to the articles, connect it to our understanding. Allah is always there with us, right? And um, we 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 can always have somewhere to lie on. Right when when we are addressing these issues, all right. That that's another thing from me. Next ne ne slides. Yeah, looking at some dynamics, life has meaning and purpose. That's for sure. Yeah, no matter how difficult, no matter how challenging, uh, we may think we may think our own problem, our own challenges is. Is the is the highest of all, but or we may think we are the only one passing through some kind of things. Um, but at the same time, I come to realize that uh, challenges in life and even happy moments in life, there is a particular way Allah gives it to every individual. Different circumstances, different challenges, different happy moments to every individual uh, on the surface of the earth, based on what we can bear. There's another verse on that. Um, Allah is not going to give us something that we cannot bear. I don't know if we're able to get that in, in, in a clearer picture. 
allow understand the fact that we have certain strengths. It's only when we're able to identify those strengths, either spiritually or psychologically, that are strengths that can make us move on. And whatever challenges we are passing through, we have the strength to bear them, all right? Now, I've, I've seen some aspect of, I mean, existence in terms of what is happening in a place like um, Istanbul, in a place like Saudi Arabia, in a place like Bangkok, I've been to these countries. And of course, as a Nigerian, I've lived in some number of states like Lagos in Nigeria, in Abuja, in Ofa, where I come from, even though I only spent a night there ever in my life. And um, now when I compare these areas, the, the human suffering in Nigeria is there. The human suffering among the Saudis, among Malaysians is there. Now, the degree at which these sufferings affect every individual differs. But the reality is there is human suffering on every individual on the sources of the act. But they differ in terms of dimensions, they differ in terms of structures, they differ in terms of what circumstances we are living in in those places. So meaning as the dynamics in terms of what we are actually passing through in our life, in terms of where we are living, in terms of what exactly are we doing in that place we are living, in terms of so many things, all right? So, um, meaning also in connection to our Islamic understanding provides a framework for our life's journey, all right? Um, like I was saying, I don't know, maybe it's in the next slide. It is only when we, we, we connect our life in this world to the next world, it's only that particular time we understand the entire framework of what our life journey looks like. As I'm talking to you now, just like any other individual across the globe, nobody's ready to die right now. Nobody's ready to die. If you ask me, I'm very much not ready. I still want to live just like any other person. I still want to enjoy this life just like any other person. And I mean, well, there's one reality that we need to understand also that for us to really comprehend the enjoyment in this life, we need to fashion out our preparation for the next life. We need to fashion out how do we want to live in the next life? How do we want to live it? What kind of life do we want to live there? We need to always have that in our cognition. We need to make sure we feel it. And by behavior, we need to make sure we do certain things to make that life a better place for us when we get there, because there's a very much reality that we are going to get there. Now, how do we get there when we don't know? It can be very sudden because it's always sudden. We're always planning, we're always having, I mean, goals, we're always having targets, we're always having aspirations above that time. That's natural. It's never going to stop. Now, the thing is, what do we do? Like, like I see here in Malaysia, I mean, among the elderly, because here in Malaysia, see, the youths are not always in the mosque. I don't know if it's, it's, it's already like that also in Nigeria. I do believe the, the youngest are always in the mosque in Nigeria. I mean, generally. But here, the elderly ones are much more in the mosque. Now, what I come to realize among them is, it's like they are preparing for the next life. Okay? They take it very seriously. Uh, most of them are retired. I'm talking about the men. And even women alike. Most of them are retired. They are very much at home. So what they do after subu, they, they go home and come back again for Quranic classes. They go home and come back again for Zoo. They go home and come back again for Asr. The same men, some even on wheelchair, I mean, they come in serious devotion because they could see that their life is ending and they will do charity work. 
they donate and the donation they give is being used to sponsor students who study in the university in that area. This is what I know. And I see it as, I have discussed with some number of them, they see that, okay, I don't know how many years I have to live, but before I die, I need to do certain things. All right, they, they understand that, that, okay, yes, I need to prepare for that next life. I need to do this, I need to do that. So there is that extra devotion being put when they become 60, they become 65 into their life. So Islam and everything that has to do with how well do we connect ourselves with the next life has, it gives us this framework of what our life journey looks like. And um, it also gives us that ability to add meaning to daily events. What I mean by daily event is whatever we are passing through on a daily basis, we're always connecting it to a clearer understanding of, of, of what purpose am I experiencing this? We're always having that. And it, it, like I always say, it's all depending on how much do we comprehend our, our Islam, how much do we put it into understanding? How does this understanding transform into our, our behaviors and everything? So, yes, both in good times and bad times, Islam is always there for us. Mind you, when things are happening in form of pleasurable activities, when we are achieving a lot, we are doing so many good things, when, when life is looking good, I mean, sometimes it can be very challenging. Yes, for some, they don't even know how to manage happiness. They don't even know how to manage success. And they do things extraordinarily negative towards, you know, what Allah has blessed them for. People some don't even know how to manage success. They misinterpret it and they go beyond board, right? Uh, that's another issue. Then Islam gives us a sense of control. When I say sense of control, I mean that ability to take proper direction to what we do as, as humans, whether in good time or bad time. Islam gives us that leverage, that ability to control our daily activities. It gives us the able to control what we do in terms of human relations with our family members, with our wives, with our children. It gives us that level of control to how we interact with our fellow students, with our fellow workers. I mean, that also gives a clear directive of the fact that everything joined together, whether in form of control, whether in form of spirituality, in terms of ibadah, whether in terms of even what we eat. Mind you, um, Recently, people are becoming more conscious of what we eat because what we are eating is having issues to do with our, our health now. People are becoming more conscious of that. And it is only when we see it, even from a religious perspective, that we'll be able to have some element of control on what we do. More especially in this part of the world, I mean, people are becoming more disturbed. We don't even trust what we are eating anymore. And, um, you know, we, we some, sometimes we get scared, right? And um, it, it, it gives it gives some level of understanding also from our from our Islamic orientation to the fact that yes, we we need to you know exercise some level of control in what we do. Islam provides all these um, guidelines, and um, yeah, maybe the next slide. Okay, this, this is the level of death acceptance according to Wong. Paul Wong is a prominent uh, existential psychologist in Canada, he's based in Canada. And um, somewhere in 2018, he shared this five level of death acceptance on his Facebook page. I got this from his Facebook page, he never published it. And um, while I was going through, I felt, what, what was Prof saying here, I tried to look at the entire five stages, the entire five levels of death acceptance. 
because generally we see death as the highest level of suffering anyone will pass through in order to see much more meaning to this life, okay? And it is this same death that gives us much more meaning and understanding into how well we accept what is going to happen in the next life, all right? So death is a, it's like a breach. Now, how do we actually understand this death concept? How do we see death anxiety as an issue? Because every individual has that anxiety for death. Uh, looking at the way it has been described in the Hadith, looking at everything surrounding it, nobody wants to be thinking about it that easily, right? It can be threatening, it can be fearful. I mean, it takes a very high level of spirituality to to, you know, you know, to, to understand it and to, you know, have that ability to go through it, to process it. Um, at the first level, he's talking about cognition. He said a rational understanding of death as a biological fact of all living things, okay? It's like, that sounds good. Emotional level, readiness to face death without feeling the terror of death anxiety. Means. How easy is one ready to face death? I can remember in one of the ideas, the prophet said we should not even wish for it. Right? That ideas gives us a clear understanding of the fact that it's not something that is that easy to process, either cognitively or emotionally. All right? Um, Behaviorally, ability to make the necessary arrangement for one's final exit. Okay, that can be easily processed. Behaviorally, we can do some number of things. Our Ibadah is always there. We, we pray our Salat. We are very much conscious that yes, anytime the death will strike. So we shouldn't find ourselves in, in the negative side of events, in the negative side of behavior, in the negative side of anything. We need to be in like in a preparatory mode so that whenever death comes, at least we, we, we look a bit safe, right? Something like that. So behaviorally, we do some number of things. Um, like I was telling about the elderly here, they, they prepare seriously. I mean, from what I interactions with them because um, the, 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 the issue of death is something very threatening. So they, they see it very seriously here. And in terms of donations, in terms of sadaka, in terms of helping the needy, they are very good in doing that. Just in the sake of the fact that, yes, they want something in form of sadaka to jairia, right? Based on that concept of jairia, they want to be rest assured that here in their life, something is already counting for them after they die. Okay, that understanding gives them a very much clear preparation for, for, for making arrangements for the debt itself. So it all depends on how many of us are ready to do that, to start doing that right now. The Vera level, one is right, one is right. The next slide. Okay, we have the existential level. The feelings of satisfaction that one has lived a fairly meaningful life. Now, I don't know if I'm going to pose this question to everyone, but the thing is, how, how much satisfaction do we have in terms of what we've done with our life so far? Irrespective of our age, right? Age is a factor here. But if we look at it critically, how much satisfaction in terms of feelings do we have for our life generally? Have we actually lived a meaningful life or we still have some goals to achieve that can really give us the, the indication that yes, our life is meaningful? At this level, which one calls existential level is very, very subjective, highly subjective. And it's, it's much more like um, individual to individuals. It's more like 
what are we actually doing with our life now? What have we done in the past? Okay, we can also connect this to the psychosexual stages, sorry, psychosocial stages of Erickson. When Erickson is talking about generativity versus, I think, stagnation, and he was talking about, you know, if at the age of 60 to 65, and you're already, you know, engaging in some kind of philanthropic activities, you are doing some humanitarian work after your retirement, and you are doing so many beautiful things to make other people's life better. I mean, you're already doing things relating to Sarakati Jairia for your next life. It makes a lot of sense that, yes, you have that satisfaction that even after you die, your children are very much ready to continue the good work you've been doing. They keep praying for you and all those kind of stuff. But if one is in that position where things are not really looking good, you are not even contributing anything to people's well-being, you are not doing anything, you are only much like connected or concentrating to yourself only. I mean, at that level, existentially, that feeling, feeling of satisfaction may really not be there, all right? So we, we can also see from this perspective, existential level one, one also is right if we can actually get it, although it's subjective from individual to individual. And the last stage is somehow questionable because it has to do with some kind of belief system. He is not a Muslim anyway. He said it's anticipatory level. Finally looking forward to the end of life and entering either a state of nothingness or the mysterious realm of the afterlife, okay? On one side, it feels that after death, there's nothing anymore. I mean, the human life is terminated, so it ends there. That's what it means by nothingness. On the other side, for those of us that believe in anything after life, it's still mysterious, it's not clear. I mean, if we are talking about the, the, the experience in the grave, we are talking about somebody having Sarakati Jaria and is getting some benefit in the grave, the grave is being widened, there is a light inside there. This uh, professor is saying is mysterious, all right? After life, after the day of judgment, I mean, the good ones will, will enjoy and those on the other side will have to pay the price of their, you know, wicked actions in this life. So he, he tag all this as mysterious, and as Muslims, of course, we need to see it in a much more bigger picture. And that's why I said in our previous slide that as Muslims, we see life, I mean, life, Islam has placed us in a greater perspective to see things beyond this life, to see that, yes, we are anticipating it, but at the same time, we need to know exactly what we want to achieve there. We need to know exactly how we want to live our life now. How we, need, how we need to live a meaningful life, how we need to live a satisfactory life, a satisfactory life, a meaningful life that is connected to a much more fruitful and better life in the year after, okay? Even in our grave, yes, we, 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 can, we can derive so many beautiful things there based on what we are doing now. So he's not able to connect that at the anticipating level. But for us as Muslims, you can see that, yes, this is what life has put to us. And this is how Islam has made it much more easy for us to understand. This is how we can see much more meaning to, to what we do. Okay, uh, next, next slide. So I, I hope I'm still within the time. Okay, Palizzo and Park is talking about how well do we engage in some number of things that can make our life meaningful on a daily basis. How do we interpret our daily events, uh, the structure and motivations of our daily life, and the general levels of mood and life satisfaction, okay? I think I only pick up the first one. Next slide. Um, this interpretation of life events, okay, this one. Islam guarantees that whatever happens to an individual, no matter how good or bad, will surely make sense. All right? And um, yeah, on a daily basis, we, we only see things 
much more clearly when we interpret it on the basis of our articles of faith, on the basis of our God consciousness, on the basis of our entire worldview, I mentioned earlier on. And it is only when we see things in this particular platform, in this particular framework, we can only see that, yes, in the end of everything, there's a lot of sense in it. Allah is very much in control. Allah is very much ready to, you know, do the best for me when I ask him. Even though I'm not getting it now, I'm going to get it later in this life. Even if it's not in this life, I'm going to get it in the next life. My prayers are not wasted. I mean, that's, that's belief and that conviction connects us to, to, to him and it's not never going to let us lose him, all right? I, I, I don't know if that kind of belief can be bought in the market, cannot. We cannot get that, we cannot buy such kind of belief in the market, it's, it's a conviction. I mean, it's a conviction that if it remains in a Muslim continuously, I mean, it's, it's priceless. It's priceless, considering the fact that what you experience daily is not really looking good. Um, I was in Nigeria and I saw everything. Around 2 a.m. I just woke up, there's no light, there is serious heat, and I was sweating and I told my sister, wow. I mean, the level of suffering we are passing through right now is, is really out of this world. I, I can't just imagine. And um, that's on one side. And on another side, you know, even when we are trying to do something, the president just announced subsidy removal and even here in Malaysia, I'm feeling the impact. And I was like, okay, yeah, we, 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 see, we see how well we move with this. But the fact is that whatever happens, whatever happens, we still see sense in it, all right? We still see sense in it in the sense that, um, the suffering is only going to be transient. It's going to be ephemeral. It's not going to last long, all right? We've been passing through many sufferings. Some findings I will show you that Nigerians are suffering and smiling, suffering and happiness. In this high level of suffering, some people are still cracking jokes, all right? In the social media, I was at the highest, I mean, at the point at which I was feeling angry to the removal of self subsidy, even though everything is going on, I mean, and somebody is showing a video where some, some guys are just saying that, no, 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 no. You can't use my petrol to wash your hand because you are impairing my generator. It became chaotic and, you know, Nigerians are like, I don't know how to put it. We, 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 we show, maybe I'll call it resilience. No, maybe I will show, I, I, I don't know what to call it. At that point of, you know, hardship, we still see something that keeps us going. I mean, generally, we are not talking about whether we are Muslims here. We are talking about the general view to things. People still uh, keep moving on. People uh, still keep, you know, living their life the way they want to do. The, 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 the suffering continues. All right? And it's not that maybe this suffering is not limited only to Nigeria, it's across the globe. I can start giving several instances as regards the COVID. Alhamdulillah, in, in, in Africa generally, the COVID is not an issue. There was no much lockdowns. Here in Southeast Asia, that is very close to China, we had lockdowns up to a year. So I, mean, I think you should uh, try to be rounding up. Maybe you all right, all right. I'm almost there. So during the COVID, during that highest level of suffering of human death and destruction of you know, people's families, people, people still keep moving on. And it all depends on how well do we see our daily activities, how well do we interpret. Meaning and spirituality, yes, it looks like spiritual go to cause primary during times of suffering, yes. Uh, through suffering, humans develop character, coping skills, and a base of life experience that may enable them to manage future struggles more successfully. Let, let, let's get to this slide where I have this news report of what happened in Dublin some years ago. Ne next slide, next slide. 
I just want to share this. Um, the next one, the next one. I mean, we are still trying to explain the same thing here. Yeah. What happened here some years ago in Dublin, Republic of Ireland, there was a gang fight, right? This gang, they, 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 they attack a particular gang. And this gang that was attacked came back some days later to, 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 to revenge, something like that. Unfortunately, they, they attacked the house of this neurosurgeon, a Muslim neurosurgeon in Dublin, highly professional, and his wife and three kids, three sons were killed by a fire outbreak in the house. The house was burned down. And at that level of suffering, I mean, his sons and his wife was killed by mistake. But of course, these gang guys were arrested, young boys were arrested, and they really paid the price. But what we are looking at here is how much suffering do we want to see apart from something like this? Next, next slide. This particular expert, this particular neurosurgeon was so calm and to the best of his ability, he was able to even lead the janaza of the prayers. He was met by the press and they interviewed him and he was telling them that what has happened has surely come to pass. It's been, this, it's been destined. And right there in the front of the press, he was even explaining that, yes, this is what he has to pass through in his life. And this is, you know, a test from Allah. And he was saying everything. To be amazed by the, by the journalists, they were really shocked. All right? They were expecting that he has to take a seat back. He has to be consoled. and crying and everything. He was the one that led the janaza. He was at the forefront of the funeral prayers. He was, you know, he was even attending to the press. So that was so amazing. It was so shocking even to the journalists. And um, ne next slide, next slide. Prayer, for instance, can be very significant. I'm only just trying to round up here. And um, for us, as Muslims, for instance, when somebody is chronically ill by the sick bed, we offer prayers, we hope he's going to recover. And there is this particular prayer where in the ideas for that prayer, it's very much clear that if you say that prayer seven times, uh, let me see if I can remember again, is that Allah going to cure that person for you or the person is going to give up. That's what came with the prayer. That's the address behind the prayer. So we can do it seven times. That alone gives us the confidence that, yes, I'm talking to Allah right now. I'm repeating it seven times. If it is Allah's decree, this person is going to live. Yes, he's going to live. It's a conviction. It's a prayer that's not only just spiritually, you know, being said, but it's a prayer that connects us to the fact that, yes, I'm talking to Allah. It all depends on him to decide whether it's going to make my loved one live or it's going to take him to himself. I leave it to Allah, something like that. So I, I think you can hand it this way. Maybe there is any room for question and answer. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Uh, you're trying to get it detailed, and we really appreciate you. And I want us to applaud you. It's very interesting, really, uh, how you have explained meaning and spirituality. So, if you have questions, let us put it in chat. Uh, for me, I have two questions. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, spirituality. Let's say that for what for us Muslim, we believe that it's fitra, meaning that we believe in Allah. And so that's the manifest in our beliefs, in our understanding that he's in charge of our affairs, the destiny and all that. How can we tap in to the psychology of a non-Muslim or someone that doesn't believe in existence of God? Knowing that it's in that person's fitra, how can we use that, tap to that fitra 
to treat uh, someone that doesn't believe in God, for instance? That's the first question. My second question is, uh, how do we balance the, the, let me say, secular or science healing and spirituality meaning that we have? Okay, so maybe I'm sick. And like you have said, the last example, okay, maybe there's a particular door. Uh, maybe Prophet said that maybe if you have this kind of pain in this kind of area, just touch it and it should go. And then we have paracetamol or panadol that can do some job. Uh, or, so we have this conviction that oh, I'm just going to follow that door. So where do we strike balance in this healing? Well, we know that there are, it's also, it's not as if the, the, the Islam go against using this. Uh, Medical aid. No. So these are two questions. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, for the first question, connecting to somebody who is an atheist, if I got it rightly. Yes, correct. And how well you want to explore or tap into his fitra <laughs> for him to like uh accept the existence of god or i mean um it's going to be a bit difficult because uh we have so many number of them and they are spreading so much now and um without that belief like i said in the in, in the beginning of the slide it's going to be a bit difficult to convince such kind of person because um, the fitra is there naturally, right? He has a connection to the concept of God innately. Mm. In fact, there was one study, there was one study that has to do with the brain. I, I can't remember which year and who had, I, I, I read it. There is a God concept in the brain, all right? Mm. Neurological findings indicating that yes there is a connection to 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 god all right in our brain function why well, I, I don't have details about yeah. that but the reality is for someone who doesn't really believe the only opportunity you may have is to see what time and on what certain conditions can you strike into that person's spectra maybe after certain events. I've come across this particular event where, was it a plane crash? Yes. A plane is about to crash and one atheist was shouting for oh, God to help him. <laughs> now, in that highest level of suffering, he could even mention God for support, for help. That's the highest level of suffering when you see somebody, I mean, when you are a, you, you are in a plane and the plane is about to crash. I mean, nothing else is very much in your head other than the fact that you need to call Allah, you need to call God for assistance. I've experienced something like that too before. I mean, the plane is so shaky due to bad weather and I could not even remember when I recite, how I recited I had to pursue in seconds. I mean, so fast because the plane was really shaking. It was really shaking. This event is highly traumatic to me. And um, yes, so that kind of person, possibly I don't know how, so may only so. be explored in certain conditions like that, if mm -hmm. you have the opportunity. That's when they can get to the limelight of getting to know whether, yes, they have a connection to God or not. Okay. Because in, right. the, in, addition, in addition to that, you know, there is this positive psychology that they are trying to say, okay, they are trying to use it, but if you look at it, they're actually from spiritual teachings and they're trying okay. to use it. Yeah. So that's from, from that perspective I'm thinking about. Can answer the second question on healing. The medical one, the medical one, yes, we need to take our drugs, please. <laughs> our drugs is very much, you know, um, useful to us. Biologically, they are, they are performing wonders. The drugs are manufactured and most of these drugs have been tested, all right? Biologically, they are going to make changes in the organic system we are passing through. Now, organic, uh, I mean, our biological, our physiological framework of the body, they are going to do their job. At the same time, 
we can pray, we can put our hands in the area of pain and say the prayers. Mind you, our prayers has certain level of conditions before they can be accepted. It can be accepted right away. It can be accepted at another time. So maybe at that time while you are doing the prayers, you may not feel the impact that yes, the pain will just go away. But for the fact that we have other means medically, yes, we have to take our drugs uh, to, to help with some of these physical things, physiological, organic, yeah. Just like how we eat food to survive, the drugs are also there to help us. Drugs have side effects, that's true. At the same time, we cannot do away with it. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Now, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, Abdrazak, I want you to be the last to speak. You ask your question or you make your recommendations and then you give us this closing remark. So I'm waiting for another person to raise up their hand or if, I, if you have another question. Um, Okay. Okay, stages of grief. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Brother Brazak, you can speak, please. Yeah, thank you. So please, you can give to the mark as well. Your mic is not okay. And I want to. Amen. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Now, okay, yeah. Okay, it's okay now. Thank you so much, uh, for the opportunity. Let me appreciate our guest lecturer for the wonderful presentation. Though the network was very bad here, yeah, but Alhamdulillah that I'm able to reconnect. Yeah, I want to make a quick um, remarks regarding a significant, a significant statement that you main mention of in the course of your statement, which I can relate with when you're talking about how people, you know, hold on to a scarce phenomenon, especially in respect to their faith. And I want to quickly cite, you know, an example regarding that. And we from Africa settings can easily relate with, with that. What can we say about people who about someone who hasn't built any house, but has been able to contribute to a, a, a sum of 2.5 million just to attend Hajj, like you made mention of. You know, this is how far people can go, you know, in appreciating their faith. Someone that doesn't have any house, but has been able to contribute 2.5 million. And the next thing that the person could do is to gather the money and just for the purpose of Hajj. That's why the fact that the person is living in a rented apartment. So I'm just making these you know, remarks just to show, to give a preponderance to your statement, to, 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 for us to understand how people how you know, appreciate their, their faith. Hmm. And in respect to the closing remarks, uh, well, uh, I want to please. appreciate our guest. There's a question. So for you, I just got a question now. Uh, Sister Amir, uh, Obor Amir Yaku is asking, Please, how do we Can correlate the topic more with patients during challenging okay. times and comfort moments? Do you get my question? Uh, please, can you come again? Please, how do we correlate the topic more with patients during challenging times and comfort moments? During challenging times and comfort moments, how do we connect with patients? I think it's not really clear. Yes, yes. I think that how do we use this topic? How, how oh. relevant can this topic be to? Oh, to okay. Um, yeah, the topic is very much like centering on meaning, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and spirituality due to the fact that in challenging times, yes, when things are not really looking good, when things are tough, we can easily connect to Allah at that period. We can easily start doing istighfar, we can easily start doing all sorts of prayers. That's when we can easily stand up quickly for tajud. We want to fast. Okay, there is that spirituality connection. 
when things are not really looking good, we want to pray and get things solved. We want to pray and get things better for ourselves. We want to pray for our loved ones. Yes. So many for patient person, we can recommend to them spiritual exercises. Yes. At the same time, when a patient is on a sick bed and things are getting improved, all right, things are getting better. We've seen some number of patients. In fact, I was in lawsuit, like I said, like a month ago for my dad. We've had number of cases where patients have been patients have been tagged to die in the next couple of days, two, three days from now. And those patients are still alive. The patient stood up, eventually stood up from the bed and he was discharged, an elderly man. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it is not everything like medically connected to what the doctors are saying. Oh, this particular illness is terminal is going to die at this particular time. I mean, Allah is very much in control. Yes. It is only the Allah that gives life and it's only Allah that takes life. Mm. And um, I was also going through the comments now. I, I, somebody said drug kills more than it heals, all right? I agree, I agree. We, we have some number of drugs. Medically, things are not so like good the way we are painting it when it comes to some drugs. At the same time, I can tell you a revealing information about one of our professors here who had a very rare cancer, very, very rare cancer case. Um, The drug is not even in Malaysia. The drug is only, I mean, only manufactured by Pfizer in the US. Pfizer US only. Now, the doctors ask this particular patient, how much do you have? I mean, what's your pension like? This is an aging professor already. And when they saw his bank account, they saw his gratuity and his pensions and everything, they found that, yes, he can be able to pay nothing less than, like, for the fight in Naira, maybe not like 5 million Naira every month, treatment. Immediately, the order for that drug buys from Pfizer in the US. The drug is to be taken for one and a half years with about 6 million Naira per month. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, this professor is strong now after about seven months in treatment already, especially made that drug was not even flew by the average Korea, like, uh, I mean, the general one. It is a special flight from US by Pfizer to Singapore. From Singapore, they flew it to Kuala Lumpur and strictly give it to that doctor directly to start administering to this drug. So we are talking about science, we are talking about medications, we are talking about drugs. Sometimes it depends on how much do you have, how much can you pay to get these drugs. Drugs kills, there are so many factors connected to that, but drugs actually heals. Yes, based on our last design that it's not your, it's not your time yet. You can get out of this, you can still survive this. I mean, so many factors connected, but yeah, drugs do heal much. also. Yeah, something thank like that. For, for that perspective, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so do we have, if you have any other question? Okay, so Brother Brazil, if you can give us a closing remark. Thank you very much. We are no, glad I'm, to, I'm really glad to, for this discussion. So just go ahead, Brother Brazil. So, Alhamdulillah, we give thanks Almighty Allah for his uh, mercy upon us for, and for giving us this opportunity to attend this program again. Let me start by appreciating our guest lecturer mm. for his time and for delivering a wonderful um, lecture. This is a professorial lecture, I have to say this. And also I want to appreciate our coordinator to um, Brother Blazis for your time also, because you, are, you have been a, you know, you have been, we have been at the forefront of this, um, of this program, by ensuring that everything, you know, takes proper shape. I want to appreciate you also. So permit me to appreciate um, one of the audience who happened to be one of our one of my boss, you know, in the mental settings, uh, Doctor Tadudina Bila. I want to appreciate you, sir. I want to appreciate you for attending our program. 
really appreciate you. And to all the audience, to all the participants, we appreciate you and we appreciate Mercy to continue to be with each and every one of you. Yes, thank you so much. So we also appreciate all the teams, the West African team, we appreciate you all. And now to formally, okay, openly call on to Dr. Tajini Abiola. <laughs> okay, we would like to have him in our next lecture, inshallah. <laughs> Oh, that's a tax one. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. we can, let's invite him to make some few words with us before he leaves. Uh, okay. can he... he can unmute his mic, inshallah. Uh, now, please let me just uh, stop the recording. Thank you.